So a Sunday, one Sunday, a cowboy goes to church. When he entered, he saw that he and the preacher were the only ones there. Preacher asked the cowboy if he should go ahead and do the sermon, should go ahead and preach. And the cowboy said, well, I'm not too smart, but if I went out to feed my cattle and only one showed up, I'd sure feed him. So the minister began his sermon. One hour passed. Two hours passed. Two and a half hours. Three. Finally, the preacher finished. He went down and asked the cowboy how he liked the sermon. Cowboy said, well, I liked it all right, but if I went out to feed the cows and only one cow showed up, I sure wouldn't try and stuff them all with all the hay. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for another day that you've given us and grateful for uh, uh, another opportunity to open up your word. Father, we are, we're so thankful for these accounts in the Gospels that we're allowed to, to look at your son and look at what he did for us and the, the, the attitude, the actions that he brought uh, to this ministry and this life and those that we're allowed to emulate. Father, I ask that you would teach us tonight what you have to say to us. Tell us how we can be more like him. Tell us how we can better set ourselves aside and seek uh, uh, your, to please you and please you only. Father, we're thankful for the family that we're a part of, thankful uh, for the things that are coming up in our church family. We're very excited about being back together again. We're thankful that, that, you're, that you're allowing that to happen. Father, this night is yours. We ask your hand to be on it, and it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. And just to say real quick, by the way, as you're uh, turning back to uh, uh, Matthew 14, uh, that uh, as we announced on Sunday, we are having, starting uh, May 31st, a uh, marathon Bible reading where we're declaring our belief that God is in control, that he has been all along, and that we look for him to be in control of how uh, uh, these changes take place and how we manage to come together and how we manage to overcome any of the obstacles that, that, the, that the society or Satan might throw in our path uh, as we try and do his will. And that, bi uh, that Bible reading will start at 2 p.m. on the 31st. Uh, it'll be going through until we finish uh, sometime on Wednesday night, half hour increments, men, women, and children and remember I told you on Sunday, children at the discretion of their parents who can read well, if the, ch if the parents will go up there and sit with them, uh, can sign up for it. Uh, we have uh, information out on the website. We have uh, information in the bulletin uh, about the numbers that you can call. Uh, you can, the, the, the sign-up sheet, the sheet of, of signed up is on the website. You can go see it. But to sign up, you need to call us. It's either me or Teresa West or Justin Schiff. And uh, we're really looking forward to that. Uh, remember, as we were looking last week, chapters 14 through 20, uh, we're dealing with uh, Jesus really uh, starting to uh, culminate his ministry and starting to look toward Jerusalem for that last time. Uh, it deals, it's primarily in three groups, every chapter is. It's, it's, it's the enemies, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders who are trying to derail him the multitudes, the, the crowds that continue to follow him, and then his disciples that he's trying to teach, that he's trying to get up to speed to what it's going to be like when he's not there anymore. And so we had finished, we had looked at uh, uh, the thing about his enemies. You remember last week we talked about Herod uh, and uh, arresting John the Baptist and finally having him beheaded, and, and that's really kind of where we ended last week. And so this week... Uh, the, the word was compassion when, talk, when dealing with the multitudes. Uh, Jesus and his disciples, one of the things we, we started this chapter 14 with, we said there are, multi, there are multiple times in these seven chapters that Jesus withdraws. It says he'll withdraw to another region or he'll, he'll withdraw he and his disciples uh, to another place. And his disciples were in need of real rest. Mark 6, 31, then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. But what we see is time and again, the needs of the multitude would touch Jesus' heart and it would derail uh, his resting. It would derail that, that plan to try and take that time. And, and there, it's, it, it's in this uh, verse, it says that he was moved with compassion uh, when he saw the multitudes. A and and a time and again, that, that term seems to dictate Jesus' choices. Literally, the Greek term, moved with compassion, uh, it means to have one's inner being stirred. And I, 
I kind of looked it up, and the idea is it's more than sympathy, which is, you know, I feel sorry for you. It's more than empathy. I understand how you feel because I've kind of experienced the same thing happening in my life. It is literally that everything in his being is moved towards them, that it, that it literally stops everything else from happening, and he turns towards it as well. This phrase, moved with compassion, actually shows up 12 times in the Gospels. When he saw the needy, uh, for instance, when he saw the needy multitudes in Matthew 9, twice when he saw their hunger in chapters 14 and 15, which will be in next week, for the two blind men in Matthew 20, the leper in Mark 1, the sorrow of the widow of Nain in Luke 7. Jesus used the term in three of his parables. The king had compassion on his bankrupt servant. Remember that story in Matthew 18. The Samaritan had compassion on the victimized Jew. That's in Luke 10. And the father had compassion on his returning son. That's the parable of the prodigal son story in Luke 15. This term doesn't appear in Scripture just for us to be impressed, however, by God's capacity to show his compassion. We were in, uh, on Mother's Day, we were in uh, 1 Corinthians 13. And if you'll remember, we, we just looked at a handful of those terms that describe the love of God. The, lo the love of God, the compassion of God, the mercy of God, the graciousness of God um, are really beyond our comprehension. The enormity of them uh, is really beyond our measure because it's, it's, it's more than what he chooses to do. It literally is who he is. But I believe this term in Scripture is, is, is the moved with compassion is shown so many times because it begs for us to look inward. It begs for us to ask of ourselves, if our Heavenly Father has this level of compassion for us, if that's the compassion that sent His Son to, this, to the earth, if, if that's the compassion that allowed Him to compel that Son in, in His will to go to the cross, if that's the compassion that, that allowed Him to again and again for, forgive the children of Israel and, and, and to turn around and to, and to save them from one peril after another all through the Old Testament, if that's the compassion God has for us, shouldn't that be the desire, that, shouldn't it be our desire to have the same compassion towards others. If we desire to be like Jesus, this is what we arm ourselves with. If we desire to show the world that we're not just a great social club where there's friendly people who, 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 who they can come and, and enjoy their company, and if we're to show them that there is something eternal going on here, and we're to be the difference maker to show them what their need is, shouldn't we desire and pray for that same kind of compassion for others. Not a compassion to be sympathetic, not even a compassion to be empathetic, but a compassion that so moves us that it literally stops everything else in our life and moves us towards bringing that need uh, uh, an answer. The feeding of the 5,000 is recorded in all four Gospels. It's a story of a great miracle. But it's also illustrative of the gap in our thinkings at times when it comes between us and the Lord. We know the disciples knew that Jesus was powerful. We know that the disciples knew that he was powerful enough to meet this need in the crowd. I mean, think about some of the things they'd already, thought, they'd already seen. Really, bringing out food and to be able to feed people probably was, shouldn't have been out of their imagination. But instead of turning to him for help, Kind of follow, think about that in that story. They, they took stock of their monetary resources. They took account of what food was on hand. That was the five loaves and the two fish. They weighed the practical facts of the time and the place and the, you know, and the, the crowd's weariness and the availability of towns and, you know, and, and all those things. And instead of turning to Jesus, they call for the people to be sent away and look for their own food. How many of us? are guilty of believing that God can work in, a, in our lives, that God can work through our lives. Even, even we acknowledge that we accept in faith that God has the ability to do so, and yet when the time comes, when the need presents itself, instead of pouring ourselves out before the Lord and putting it before him, we immediately gird ourselves up trying to figure out what we can do, struggling 
to do our best. Jesus didn't just want to feed these people. Jesus wanted to teach his disciples and to teach us the true nature of both faith and surrender. Let's take a moment at the steps taken in this account and the lessons we can learn allowing God to work in life's problems. The first thing, the first step is you've got to start with what you have. Andrew finds the boy with a small lunch. He brings the lad to Jesus. The, boy, the boy's lunch is not taken from him, by the way. The boy is, is given the opportunity to give his lunch to the Savior in order to help feed everyone else, which he willingly does. Guys, there's a lot of times that we think we're inadequate. We take stock of what we have to offer talent-wise or, or monetary-wise or time-wise, and we, we think, we look at other people, and, and it just seems like they have so much more than we do. It seems like they can do so much more, and we, we think ours is insignificant. God begins with wherever we are, and God uses whatever we have if we allow him to. The second thing is you give what you have to Jesus. Jesus takes that simple lunch, blesses it, and begins to break it into pieces. The miracle of multiplication, I actually like that from a book I read, was in the power of the Spirit in the Lord. You heard it, have heard it said, little is much if God is in it. Actually, nothing is much if God is in it. And if you don't go back, believe that, go back and read Genesis 1, 2, and 3. I wonder if what, time, what sometimes holds us back from being the compassionate people we can is because instead of really truly dedicating and giving it over to the Lord, we're only giving him over a portion and we're hanging on to the rest. It's one of the terms that I actually really struggle with when we do communion every, each and every week. Too often we talk about giving a portion back to the Lord. Now I'll agree that we give a portion directly into the church, church's work. But folks, there is nothing in Lynn and my existence that is not God's. That includes our children, our grandchildren, all the material possessions and ourselves. Do we succeed at it all the time? No, we don't. But when we start apportioning off, instead of giving God what we have, allowing acknowledging, and we need to acknowledge it, acknowledging that it's his to do with as he pleases. You say, oh, yeah, but I can't afford to lose that. You know what? There's nothing that I can't afford to lose nearly like I can't afford to lose the Savior and him in my life. Third, you obey what he commands. The disciples, remember, had suggested send everybody to town, okay, right? You know, they couldn't see any other solution that they order the crowd to sit in groups as Jesus instructs. They take the baskets and begin to distribute them. Now, perhaps to their surprise, you know, this doesn't say that they went confidently knowing, you know, that it was going to work, that perhaps to their surprise, they kept passing them, <laughs> you know, and the baskets kept having food in them. And they, and they may not have been able to explain what it is, but they kept going. The miracle wasn't in them passing out the food. The miracle wasn't in them believing that while what was happening, and it certainly wasn't in understanding what was happening, but they obeyed the commands and the miracle was allowed to take place. I want you to hear that again. They obeyed the Lord and the miracle was allowed to take place. I'm not going to get into the argument about whether there's miracles today. So let's put it in these terms. Is it possible at times we're holding back God from being able to work in us and bless us? Because plain and simply, we don't start by obeying. Walking through the door that he opens up. Speaking up when he puts the person in front of us. Acknowledging who we are when we have the chance to do so. Maybe we're, we're not only just cheating God from the glory that he deserves, but we're cheating ourselves from the blessing of seeing our faith grow because we fail to obey what he commands. No one could have witnessed the miracles if they hadn't obeyed 
what Jesus had said. Then, it's interesting, <laughs> the big argument in the United States is, is all about the planet and saving the planet, right? You know, and actually, Lynn and I have been sort of distressed that the city of Fayetteville temporarily stopped doing the recycling, thank you. The recycling, you know, which, which we actually really believe in and, you know, and try and help with that. But the next thing is conserve the results. Amazingly, 12 baskets full of bread and fish pieces remained after everyone had eaten their fill. John 6, 12 says, when they had ha all had enough to eat, he said to the disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. I don't know if Lynn remembers, but our 10th anniversary, we took a trip to Mexico City. And we had a guide who was showing us around the city, and, and as often as is true in big cities, even in this country, in big cities, there were a lot of kids, there were a lot of people wanting handouts or wanting to shine your shoes for you or wanting to... The guy told us to ignore them, and at first I was thinking, well, that's kind of cold-blooded, you know, I mean, that's kind of tough. But then he pointed to the wall of the building where there were all these wrappers of partially eaten food and drinks and stuff. They actually had plenty but they threw it aside looking for more. They threw it aside and, and didn't care about it. Why is it man seems to become less appreciative the more he has? And you know, I, I've, I've fretted over this for two weeks, this question, which I put in here. I fretted over this question for two weeks, but the truth of the matter is, guys, this question needs to be asked in this country. Why is it that it seems the more there is the less appreciative we really are of having it. Instead of growing in our faith as God grows our blessings, we become used to them and stop appreciating where they come from. I've always wondered if the lad got some of the leftovers to take home. And this has nothing to do with any of the lesson, by the way. But what a surprise it had to have been to his mother who sent him off with the five loaves and the two fish, and he comes home with like three lat baskets laden down with about ten times as much food. I thought that was, I always thought that was a pretty cool. And so, and, and my statement is, talk about the miracle that keeps on giving. Let's see, you know. John next records, by the way, the sermon that Jesus gave on being the bread of life. John 6, 26 says, Jesus answered very truly, I tell you, you're looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. And I forgot to mute that. Sorry. You know, don't leave home without it. Preachers, leave home without your phone. Jesus calls himself the bread of life. He calls on them to eat the bread that never spoils and that he is that bread. But they struggle to understand or even accept what he says. At this time, the, Jew, the Jews there began to grumble about him because he said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus didn't come to wow them with a miracle. The miracle was to draw them in to hear, to hear the truth that nothing this world offers will endure, the truth that only those who hear and partake of the bread of life will live. We today are to take the same opportunity Jesus did. We're to take the opportunity to close those, clothe those in need. We're to take the opportunity to feed those who are hungry. We're to take the opportunity to visit those who are sick. And by the way, I know what a heartache that has been for some of the families here recently as they've had to drop loved ones off at the hospital unable to go in and be with them. But guys, we do none of these things simply to meet needs or to wow people with our compassion. We do them to draw them in that they might hear. Hear the word of God. Hear it after having seen it in action. Respond to the word of God to partake of the bread of life. And then Matthew moves on to talk about the disciples' care and concern. John records 
why Jesus is in a hurry to dismiss the crowd and to send the disciples back to in the boat. John 6, again, 14 and 15. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing they intend to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Jesus recognized they wanted to make him king, but, they, but not for his coming as God's son but what he could do for them, because that was the premise, you see. You understand the feeding of the 5,000, the premise for desiring that was they were getting something they all hadn't had a long time, uh, likely maybe some of them almost never in their life, and that was a totally full belly. Their motives were not in sync with the will of God, and therefore Jesus, and of course also the timing of God, and therefore Jesus removed himself from the crowd. The disciples would almost certainly have been pulled in by the crowd's intentions. For the disciples didn't yet fully understand the Lord's plan. The proof of that was their argument over who, the, who was the greatest, over their argument, over their question, the mom's question about letting the two boys sit in the right and left hand when he comes into his glory. The experience of the disciples in the storm was a necessary lesson for them and us because it offers several assurances for us when we face storms in this life. Matthew 14. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. I've already talked about actually being out on the, uh, at the shore of the Sea of Galilee on, one of our, uh, on our trip to Israel in 1998. And I, I, I'm, I, by the way, I'm grateful that I never got to witness one but all of the locals talk about the fact that these storms are really something to see and the, and, the, and the high wind maybe matches what we've seen the last, at least twice in the last week and a half here uh, in northwest Arkansas. Being in God's will sometimes means being in the storm. Now, if you're taking note, I, I, I want to take a, a, a long enough time to allow you to write these down if you're, if you're actually noting on these. Being in God's will sometimes means being in the storm. Folks, there's a portion of Protestant Christianity that preaches a perfect peace kind of mellow life, promises that kind of life if you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, accuses you of not having enough faith if storms come in your life, accuses you of failing in your attendance or in your giving uh, if trouble comes. You need to understand there are times where we are in, as the disciples are in this boat, we are in God's will while facing the storm. Jesus was the one who sent his disciples out in the boat. And I hadn't actually thought about this, but somebody else asked the question, did Jesus know they were going to face the storm? See, and I say almost certainly, see. Unlike Jonah, the disciples find themselves in a storm by being in God's will by doing exactly what the son had asked them to do. I, I, sometimes this is hard, and when I have somebody sitting in my office and they're talking about how they can't understand the tragedy that has hit in their life, they can't understand the financial difficulties that has come on them, you know, and, and, and we, we've all heard those other voices, the voices that are saying, and by the way, one of them is Satan whispering in your ear, see that God doesn't really care about you after all. And here's the proof of it because of what you're facing. I think the first lesson here has to be that we can't judge whether we are in the will of God based on our human estimation as to the success or failure of a given circumstance. And was that too, was that too complicated? We can't look at ourselves as in or out of God's will based on the rate of success or failure, based on the rate of good news, bad news. The second lesson, involves the two reasons for facing the storms. Sometimes the storm is the correct path. It's a path for us to strengthen our walk in the Lord. It's a pretty big storm that Abraham faces when God informs him he's taking his son up on Mount Moriah and he's going to kill him and sacrifice him. It's a pretty big storm that Job faces when all of a sudden everything falls apart and he loses everything when God has called him the most righteous of men. Jonah may be the best example 
of needing to be corrected. He needed to be corrected in order to take the right path to go to Nineveh. And so the storm was to turn him around. Job is probably the best example of strengthening our walk on the right path. God calls him a righteous man. God calls him a one who fears the Lord, but, but knew that there was a necessary lesson for him, perhaps, to come to kind of come out of the, it would sound funny to say doldrums, but the doldrums of his success and instead see the necessity and the strength of God in his life. Too many religious groups make that promise of smooth sailing, but Jesus told his disciples that would not be the case. John 16, 33, I've told you these things so that you may, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you might have trouble. Who's got a Bible? In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus isn't saying that the trouble goes away because I've become a Christian. Jesus is saying that there's something bigger in my sights that when the trouble comes, I know I'm going to be a victor in it because the trouble can't defeat my Lord. Jesus is interceding, secondly. Sec, Jesus is interceding, second. Uh, <sighs> Jesus is interceding for us in the storm. I don't know why I got stuck there. Mark's record of this account says Jesus was fully aware of their plight. Verse 48 of Mark 6, he saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them walking on the lake. And that's an interesting phrase. And again, this is necessarily in our study. But remember, he went up on a mountain to pray. And it's not because he was on the right side of the mountain staring down at the, at the Sea of Galilee that he visually saw them. He saw them. Now, whether it was a vision or... Whether his, whether his father had the thing in front of him, but he, 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 it says that he saw them straining, and so he went out to them walking on the lake. Matthew, Matthew's account records after Jesus sent them away in the boat that he went up alone to pray. Every reason to believe that Jesus is at least, among other things, praying for them in the storm and what's going to happen to them. Our Savior continues even now praying for his people in life storms. Favorite chapter in Romans, Romans 8, verse 34. Who is the, then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. More than just going to bat for us with the Father, Jesus intercedes knowing exactly what the storm we, uh, that we face is like, Hebrews 4, 15 and 16, we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne with grace of grace, uh, God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Picking it up in Matthew's account, shortly before dawn, uh, dawn Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. Third point, Jesus will never leave us alone to face the storm. I've actually never thought about this, but the, well, there's a question in the book. Why did Jesus walk on water? To show the disciples his superiority? To show us he could? to wow them with another miracle, to give them perspective, maybe, that the thing they feared, the wind, the waves, the storm, were merely a staircase for the Son of God to use in coming out to them. Why is this important? How many are in fear of this virus? And not just the virus itself, fearful that life will never be the same again, fearful that jobs, relationships will never come back, really? But perhaps then what we have here to learn is this virus, like every other storm life has to throw at us, is merely a staircase for the Lord to approach us, the Lord to help us, 
and the Lord to be recognized by us as the one who stands by our side. Why didn't the disciples recognize Jesus? I mean, after all, they've been walking with him now for about nearly two years. Now, I know what Lynn and I look like coming out of a pool or something, you know, and I know you look a little different, you know. But why didn't, but I, you know, but I actually, kidding aside, why didn't they recognize Jesus? Why, why the ghost? I think it's because, frankly, it's a pretty simple answer. They weren't looking for him. They'd never seen anyone walk on water before. So they jumped to the conclusion that it's got to be a ghost because, after all, nobody can walk on water. Fear and faith can't succeed together. Faith is believing in the unseen. Fear of the unknown blinds us and keeps us from seeing. Going on in Matthew 14, Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. And Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? Fourth, God uses the storm to help us grow. Peter becomes the focal point. He calls out to Jesus asking him if he could join him in the water. And Jesus says, sure, come on. And Peter does. And I've always said, let's give him credit for two things, or for maybe for three things. He asked, because he was only one out of 12 who did, he actually got out of the boat. And by the way, he's the second guy to walk on water because he actually started. Why then does Peter sink? Peter hadn't learned yet the difference between a faith that is enough to start and a faith that is there to sustain and finish. According to Jesus, doubt crept in and overshadowed his faith. The Greek word that we translate doubt carries a really interesting meaning. It is standing uncertainly at two ways, standing at a fork. That was that used to be the joke on Johnny Carson. When you get to the fork in the road, take it. You know, um, standing at the fork, not knowing which way to go. But Peter started with an unwavering faith. He had never seen anyone else walk on water. He certainly had never walked on water, but he left the boat with no, left the boat with no reservation and walked sight unseen. But his faith wavered when he came to the fork in the road. Which way to take? Continuing to see only Jesus and continuing to do, do the impossible or recognize the reality of the situation he was in with the winds and the waves and begin to sink. Peter accepted the reality and went down like a stone. Now, I think Peter deserves the credit of getting out of the boat, but I also think he deserves credit for crying out, Lord, save me. Peter had begun to sink because he thought, I can't walk on water. By the way, he was right. But Peter realized he had missed the real truth. Peter couldn't make it possible, but Jesus could, and God could also save him. And what I like about Peter is, without stopping to think about it, he went to the one place where he knew he could be saved. Peter learned about himself the same way Abraham did in being asked to sacrifice Isaac. Peter learned about his Savior, that he's always ready to let us try, and he's always ready to pick us up when we fail. The storms of life aren't easy, but the storms of life are necessary if we desire to learn more on how to trust in the Lord and the Lord alone, for they'll show us the importance of obeying His Word, of taking the chance and of following, and of listening only to Him. Faith is not believing in spite of the evidence. Faith is obeying in spite of the consequences. We will pick up next week in chapter 15. I hope you have a great week. We'll see you later.